So I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, who is Will Evans. Uh, Will is a GP in Yorkshire, and he's also chairman of the Newman Pick Society. Um, he's going to talk about rare diseases. Uh, we do have a UK national strategy for, for rare diseases, which um, was published in 2013 and made 52 different recommendations around um, the care and management of rare diseases. So I'd be very interested in hearing from Will um, what, he, what his current thoughts are around this. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you, Imran. Um, yes, um, so I'm going to talk a bit about rare disease, primary care and genomics. Um, I think many people may think rare disease is the confines of secondary and tertiary, tertiary care, but um, hopefully I'll convince you in the next 10 minutes why I think this is an important area for, um, for uh, primary care and GPs to, uh, to deal with. We're going to talk a bit about um, our role in diagnosis and the care of these patients. I think um, there's an adage that um, many of you may be familiar with from, um, from medical school that when you hear hoofbeats, don't expect to see a zebra. But um, unfortunately, that does mean that we can overlook um, lost in the crowd patients with some of the rarer diseases. Um, a rare disease is de defined as a disease which affects fewer than one in 2,000 people, which actually means that diseases are not necessarily as rare as you think. And you, um, people are familiar with diseases such as cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis, and familiar hypercholesterolemia. Altogether, there are six to 8,000 rare diseases, um, and they're being described at a, at a rate of about five per week. So this is a hugely expanding area. And consequently, it actually means that one in 17 people will be affected by a rare disease in their lifetime. So for a su typical surgery of, let's say, 8,000 patients, this equates to 470 patients. So as you can see, collectively, rare diseases are not rare, and it's a significant part of, of what we do and, and the patients that we look after. Commonly, 80% of rare diseases have a genetic basis, and um, typically they are multi-system, and they can be severely disabling as well, life-limiting, and disproportionately affect children. 50% of rare disease patients are children. And of all rare disease patients, 30% um, of patients won't, ex won't reach their fifth birthday. But I must emphasize, rare diseases affect all, all ages um, and need to be on the radar when we're, when we're consulting with all patients. For the purposes of kind of commissioning, NHS England actually breaks it down to even a much rarer, called the ultra-rare diseases for service provision is affecting them few hundred, fewer than 500 patients. So if we talk about rare disease diagnosis, often they describe a thing called a diagnostic odyssey. Um, and typically it's um, it, on average five years for a, a rare disease patient to achieve a diagnosis. But often that can be measured in decades or a large number, if not the largest number of patients actually never receive an accurate diagnosis. And this often reflects years or even decades of uncertainty, investigations, hospital attendances, misdiagnoses, inappropriate in and ineffectual treatments with a huge waste of time, effort and resources, most importantly for the patient, but also for healthcare systems um, as well. We're at a time when there's improved diagnostics with much better molecular understanding of disease, which one would hope this would lead to better um, and quicker diagnoses for these patients, but unfortunately still there's often a long diagnostic odyssey. So sometimes people may think, rare disease diagnosis, um, um, what, is, you know, what is the benefit of having a diagnosis when actually 95% of rare diseases have no approved therapy? I think it's important, one thing that, which always I come back to when I think about getting a diagnosis when there's not a disease-specific therapy is cystic fibrosis, which since the early 70s, um, for every year as it's gone forward since the 1970s, life expectancy has increased by half a year. So there's a, more than a 25 to 30 year increase in life expectancy uh, since the early 70s for people with cystic fibrosis. So a child born in 2000 has a median predicted survival of 50 now. But also, you can't undervalue and the ending the uncertainty of that long protracted odyssey, an explanation for parents, access to expert care, um, and an opportunity for what is actually a massively expanding area of drug development for rare diseases. And also very importantly, re reproductive choice and family planning. Many, many families have multiple children affected before they get a, get a diagnosis. And an early diagnosis gives the opportunity for, for things such as um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and prenatal testing as well as making decisions about lifestyle, work, um, and also accessing educational and social support is actually very difficult if you don't have a diagnosis. 
so again, what's the relevance to primary care? So collectively, rare diseases are not rare. One thing, when we're caring about patients with rare disease, there may well be no local expertise or knowledge. Children, um, individuals may be looked after at a specialised centre quite some distance away. And as a GP, you can know the patient, the family and disease and get familiar with that and how it affects that individual. Also, I think GPs are, un are an increasingly unique position. We're the last bastions really of generalists with an overview of the whole patient. Um, and therefore, we can look at all aspects of care. Um, and we're the ability to identify patterns often frequently missed by secondary care, where they're single organ or specific disease focused. We have a continuity of record, um, and we also have knowledge of the broader family. And we can think about, are they at risk? Are there reproductive issues? And also, I think we have unique skills in managing uncertainty. Um, and also, we already exclude the rare among the common. So when we're diagnosing and seeing patients, we often are looking out for things we may only see a handful of times in our career, rare cancers, significant infections amongst all the minor viral illnesses. So linking the dots is an important aspect of what we do. Revisiting inadequate historical diagnoses. Often people have patients where, is this the most plausible explanation? A person who has a historical diagnosis who's in their 20s of cerebral palsy who seems to be having a, a progressive neurodegenerative disease. I mean, certainly no one can know 7,000 diseases. Um, and actual fact, I think the way of thinking about this is just using our gut feeling. That idea when the patterns don't fit um, and it just doesn't quite fit with what we would normally expect. Looking at family histories is important. Actually, a lot of value you can get from doing a three-generational family history. And there are also quite a lot of online differential diagnosis web-based resources, such as two mentioned there and another one called Find Zebra, where you simply type in problems that a person has, and then it comes up with a list of differential diagnoses many you would, may not necessarily have thought of. An Australian group, a working group for genetics in primary care, have come up with a mnemonic to, to highlight some other areas, perhaps targeted areas where we should be thinking of rare diseases. Again, it talks about a family history, looking at multiple affected siblings or individuals in multiple generations. The G of genes talks about congenital anomalies. Certainly, if an individual has two minor anom anomalies, so these might think, be things like low set ears, high arch palate, partial syndactyly, that's where your fingers or toes are partially joined together, or even an overriding toe. If they have two or more of those, they're much higher, higher risk of having a syndrome. And indeed, 10% of people with two minor anomalies are likely to have a major anomaly. That is an anomaly that actually requires some form of treatment or intervention. I think, as often as we talked about with the familial cancers, exceptional or extreme presentations of common disorders. Um, so multiple frequent infections, early onset cancers. So if we think of things like primary autoimmune deficiencies, these are patients who present with common things, but they, they present in a different way, frequently or perhaps more severe. And these patients often have a very long protracted diagnostic odyssey before it's identified. Um, neurodevelopmental delay or degeneration is a key area with a very high frequency of genetic disorders. Um, early onset dementia is one area where often the diagnosis can raise things like metabolic diseases. Extreme or exceptional pathology, multiple colonic polyps for cancers um, and things like hemochromatitomas. And also surprising laboratory values as well. So incredibly raised cholesterols, for example, might suggest familial hypercholesterolemia. Raised CK levels uh, may think of muscular dystrophies. So this is just a, a case to kind of highlight some of the things. Um, so Joyce is a 20-year girl uh, who moved with her parents through, from Sudan when she was 14. She has mild learning difficulties, which her mum attributes to a head injury when she was an infant in Sudan. She has well-controlled epilepsy on epilim, and she was seen and discharged by adult neurology when she was 18. After an acute episode of hypercalcemia when she was a teenager, she was diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism and continues to receive calcium and vitamin D supplementation. She attends with her mother and young sister about something else, which, um, problems with menorrhagia. But in that consultation, you also note that she's got mildly dysmorphic features. And these are quite apparent when you see her next to her mother and her sister, but may not be if she was just attending by herself. There's a history of hyperparathyroidism, epilepsy and learning difficulties to you seemed just a fairly unusual combination, just didn't seem quite right. And the history of being dropped as a baby seemed a fairly unlikely cause of learning difficulty. After the surgery, you look through her notes, you look at the neurology letter, which made no reference to the previous head injury. However, a CT was performed and it was commented that it was normal. And neither the endocrinologist nor the neurologist commented on any dysmorphology or made any reference to the involvement of the other specialty. 
the GP performed a search using um, one of the web browsers uh, and typed in simply hypercalcemia, learning difficulties, and epilepsy. Um, and this produced a list of differential diagnoses. At the top of the list was um, 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which seemed a fairly plausible explanation to the GP when he read a little more. Um, the GP spoke to um, the patient and her mother and gained consent for further investigation and referral and referred to the local genetics, um, liaised with the local genetics department on the phone, who were very um, willing to chat on the phone, who advised referral for further phenotyping and investigation. They performed an array CGH, um, uh, a genetic test that identified uh, deletions on, um, and confirmed the diagnosis as, as 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which is a deletion of about 30 to 40 genes, um, also known as phallocardiofacial syndrome or de George syndrome. It has significant variation in features and severity of disease, and although it typically has cardiac and cleft palate issues, this patient had neither of those issues, but that can happen, and often is another reason why these patients may be missed. And that's, again, this disease is not that rare. It has an incidence of one in 4,000. This gave an explanation for Joyce and her family and um, further surveillance for ongoing issues and problems. So a couple of questions that perhaps we should be thinking about is when to revisit diagnosis. You know, we have new advanced diagnostics. There's new gene panels, which often can be phenotypically based. Um, and then advanced things like exome and genome sequencing. As already been touched on um, in the 100,000 Genome Project, rare diseases and cancer are the two areas which have been concentrated on. We've also got the kind of issue with, um, we have a computerized healthcare record. With all of this recorded, um, why should it be left to chance? So there is increasing work at looking at diagnostic algorithms and computer learning to try and pull out these patients. But how do we incorporate that into practice so it doesn't affect the consultation and we don't get um, false, um, the, the false positive paradox and um, alert fatigue where we're constantly being um, flagged with possibilities of these rare conditions? The phenotype of many rare diseases is broadening as well. So um, as we have better molecular understanding of diseases, later presentations with milder variants are frequently missed. Um, common diseases as well with better molecular understanding are being broken into multiple molecularly defined subtypes. So even if we think of Parkinson's disease, um, Parkinson's disease constitutes about 80% of people with Parkinsonism, but that alone is actually reflects a whole range of different um, likely subtypes with different etiologies and molecular bases. Will these then become rare diseases? So in summary, um, rare diseases are common. Getting a diagnosis even in the absence of a treatment is incredibly important. And this idea that there are so many, how can we know them on, isn't, I feel, particularly necessary. I think we can follow gut feelings and just keep asking, is it plausible? Does a diagnosis give an adequate explanation? There's a lot of diagnostic search engines, OMIM and Find Zebra, which we've already discussed. Um, and also, we should think about revisiting diagnoses and consider referral for new diagnostics and liaison with um, clinical genetics uh, or appropriate secondary care specialties. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Will. Well, we've got a couple of questions, um, which I think are really good questions from the, um, the audience. One is, um, how do you raise the question with parents if whether there may be an underlying genetic condition? Because I guess it can be a very emotive time for, for parents and families. Mm. Um, well, I think, um, as with anything, obviously, sensitively, but I think one of the things which I would say is a very valid point is that the parents often know there are things going on and often are aware that the explanations they've got are not adequate. Right. So um, I think... I think the risk is to be overly reluctant about raising these things, and I think you can approach these things sensitively, and often you will find that the parents have already some of these questions themselves. Right. A family member, how, so if a result comes in um, about a family member from 100,000 genome projects, do you think we're going to be more exposed to these results coming in from, from that particular project as GPs? Certainly, I think we, we inevitably both with the 100,000 Genome Project, but then rolling off the back of that, as they, all of these tests become main, mainstreamed and mainlined, we'll, we will need to be more literate in, with regards to the genomic technologies, okay. and this information will be, will be coming to us. Okay. Great. Thank you, Will. That was very good. Thank you. Um, so what we'd like to do now is I'd just like to invite Jude Hayward to take the chair.
and uh, I'd just like to talk about um, non-invasive prenatal diagnosis.